technology like electronic medical records, e-prescribing and practice management systems clearly plays a substantial role in pathway reporting. Can you discuss how practices are approaching this, especially those practices who may have the most need for the financial benefit of clinical pathways, but the fewest resources for actual new technology investment? All right. And the technology is, I hate to say, the most important part of this, but it really is the most important part of this. I mean, we have our physicians that are incredibly bright and they can develop the pathways, they can find the data, they can do all the things on how to treat that patient. That's not where we're finding the biggest struggle here. What we have to prove to the payer and also to the community at large is that we can track it and we can be able to identify what are those metrics to be able to say what is quality, what is not, and so it's very important that that practice has some kind of technology solution. For those that have the bigger practice management systems and the EMRs, fabulous. They're, they're already there. But like you said, for those smaller practices, they have to have another solution. And that's where they can partner with different companies in the industry that have that technology solution for them. If you look at ABSG and what they have for their different practice management tools, those can be implemented at a very low cost for the practices that they can comply with, they can report, and then they can also, at the very end, aggregate that data to be able to prove to the payer that not only clinically do we know what's best, but we also know how to report it and monitor it, reconcile it, and at the very end, be able to show you what's the most cost-effective care for these patients. Outside of technology adoption, how will providers have to modify their workflow and coordinate with other providers to deliver the right data to payers and in the right way? It's a little bit difficult because a lot of the times these practices feel like they're in competition. I mean, obviously they are. They have their markets and they're all trying to fill their space and, and keep their practices afloat. But we need to change that mentality of it being a competitive nature of it. We've got to look up and say our survival for community oncology is at stake here, especially for your smaller practices and the access to care is a big issue on that. So we've got to get over that hurdle of saying, I don't want to work with practice B down the street because I don't want them to know what I'm doing or what I'm getting paid or anything like that. But that's why we go into it with an attitude of quality. We're going to it for a quality program. That's what these payers are trying to get at. And we can get through that if you say, together, practice A, practice B, and C, they're all going to use these pathways that they've all agreed are clinically good medicine. And once you can get them to agree on that, then you move to that next step of saying, we were not gonna know what your practices is doing and some other practices aren't going to know what each individual group is doing, we're gonna look at this as an aggregate and be able to show that we're giving good quality care in the state of Oklahoma or Texas or Michigan. And it's proven to be very effective with the payers. If you can say to them, this is how all the cancer patients are going to be treated in the city or the state, excuse me, of Michigan. And as a result, the payers benefit, the practice benefit, and the patients benefit and the pharmaceutical community benefit. It's good, for, it's good business and good quality care for our patients. Leslie, what role or responsibility do physician organizations like national and regional medical associations have in providing education and guidance to their members regarding issues like these? In what ways can these associations work more closely with payers and pharma to create more collaborative relationships? Well, that's a great question because they are in the best position, these state and regional groups, to be able to have the greatest amount of impact because we are seeing more success on a state or regional level when you're looking at payer programs like this. So they have the opportunity that they're already working with their provider members to be able to provide them education. So they have the ability to get more people together and to educate them. How do you develop a pathway program? Look at case studies for other states that have been able to do it, like in Michigan, or you look at other areas like North Carolina or other states that have been very successful in collaborating and working towards a solution. 
So these state organizations have a great opportunity to not only serve as the advocacy arm and the education arm, but they also can help them get to that, to that next point of developing that payer program where it's not collusive, it's nothing like that, it's a quality initiative so that they can all come together under a, a general platform without it being centered on just one or two practices. Okay, crystal ball time. At this point next year, how much traction will clinical pathways have gained in the oncology market? Will the obstacles for rollout have changed? And do you believe practices and payers see enough benefit to eliminate some of the distrust that has historically existed between these two camps? Crystal ball, it's a reality. Pathways are going to be here. Now, it doesn't mean they're the end game. You know, like we discussed earlier, the end game is hopefully that oncology medical home. But it comes to a matter of these physicians, they have to develop their own pathway program or a third party disease management firm is going to do it for them. I mean, cancer is on the table now. NCCN released a report in January of last year and the title of that report was, Cancer is on the Table. Historically, payers have stayed away from really getting involved in the disease management of oncology. But now, with the rising costs and the biologics involved in there and the huge variability, they're now saying we have to address this. So if the provider community can't come to them with a the solution, then they're going to find an independent third party or a disease management company to do it for them. So that's where we're talking to the providers out there to say take this opportunity to, to take control over what you're doing in your state, otherwise that, that's going to be taken away from you. Leslie, this has certainly been an eye-opening discussion today. Thank you again for being with us. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back soon with another all-new episode. Until then, if it's on your mind, it's in the know.